Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first of our webinars for 2021, um, all about data migration. So how legacy data uh, can put your migration at peril and what you can do about it. So um, thanks, everyone, for joining. It's great to see so many people signed up for this uh, mixture of partners, customers, prospects and a few of colleagues as well who decided to dial in and keep us on our toes this afternoon. So um, welcome and thanks for joining. Um, what we're going to do is whiz through some slides. I'm going to introduce Adrian, who's with me today, um, and then we are going to get going. So uh, if I can just uh, do that. So Adrian, are you there? I am indeed. Hello, Good Adrian. afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us, as always. So um, we've done this before together, um, and we've always had a good discussion, and you've always given a great amount of input. So um, just to introduce Adrian, um, he's from our partner Softworks, and Exonar and Softworks are working together um, to deliver uh, data discovery into various customers. Um, and it's fair to say, Adrian, you spend your time with customers all the time in their Microsoft environments and working on data governance and the like. Would you like to just expand on that a little bit? Absolutely. So, so um, I'm Adrian, Technical Director for Softworks, and we very much specialized in a Microsoft security first approach to data and compliance uh, and work very closely with XNR. But we, uh, we spend most of our time understanding customers' requirements around security, compliance, and helping them migrate to the cloud and adopt an Office um, 365 approach and also a Microsoft first approach into securing their data. And hopefully as part of the session, we'll explore that a little bit further. Perfect. Thank you very much, Adrian. It's great to have you on board. And so um, just before we get going in earnest, I'd like to remind everybody to please ask any questions that they've got. So um, we're in the 23 platform today. On the right hand side, you've got the ability to say hello um in the thread there or to add a comment at any time if you wish to or if you have any audio problems or anything else just let us know uh, up at the top you can ask a question uh, please do ask as we go um, it's much more interesting if the session is more interactive um, and we have people um, joining in and it keeps us on our toes as well doesn't it adrian it's fair to say absolutely keeps it interesting <laughs> So uh, today, as you all know, it's about uh, data migration and how to make that more successful. And the reason we're running this session is we've had lots of customers focusing on a range of data migrations recently. It seemed like 2020 was, um, for some reason, maybe it's just coincidence, um, a really big year for people moving data around within their organizations. And um, so we thought we'd, we'd actually run a session on how that works and how our technology works Hello, Anil. Uh, nice to have you with us. Um, how that technology works and, and kind of um, bring that whole subject to life uh, for anyone who is either involved in data migration or considering it or, or getting involved in that sort of area. And really, we see um, three sort of broad areas that people are working on in terms of data migration. So we're working with customers on post mergers and acquisitions data migration, uh, which is where they're bringing together data sets, um, finding the information they need, the valuable information they need from an acquired company and then moving it across, making it available to the integrated teams. Um, we're still seeing a lot of cloud migrations going on um, and migrations also in a digital transformation context going from legacy systems to new integrated systems. So we see all of those things um, and it feels like the dramatic changes maybe in working patterns last year may have accelerated some of that as well. So let's just look, quickly look at a typical migration project. Um, obviously, it involves legacy or M&A uh, systems and storage. Um, maybe it's an old set of data within your organization. Maybe you're bringing together a group of organizations, et cetera. And obviously, we've got a target system, which is where we want all of the valuable information uh, to go to so that we don't lose it. And so it's uh, available to power the organization going forwards. Um, and really, the, the question is, how do you make that happen? And we're going to be kind of answering that in, in various different ways and looking at it. Um, the point we see in the, immediately is that typically the legacy data is very large. And in fact, I probably should have drawn these squares different sizes so that the, the square on the right hand side, the target system is smaller than the square on the left hand side. Um, that was obviously a, a thought I didn't have when I was building the slides. But um, 
one of the things that our customers talk about is how much legacy data is is here and one of the biggest challenges is actually the sheer volume of it and i'm sure adrian you would you would echo those comments absolutely i think what you'll find with organizations is the amount of data that you have in the organization it's grown over years and years organically systems gets added and the, what we are seeing is nobody really knows where all this data was or the people who did has left at um during the, the tenure at the company and somebody else has inherited it and suddenly they are now responsible for it and need to make key business decisions on legacy information so yes it's it's a uh, it's a problem i recognize all the time yeah absolutely and then the second area is that you know given that there's a huge amount of data there um there's uh the worry the concern and particularly around our information security colleagues um, around wanting to migrate risky information from the dark and potentially leave it in the open. So the risk here is that actually the fact that you had so much data and nobody knew where it was and it was kind of tucked away was in some ways um, keeping some of that data in, in the dark that probably needs to be protected better. One of the worries we hear about with our customers is that in moving it to a new system, they're going to have data in motion essentially once more. And there's a concern that they're going to bring risky data um, across into the open. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later on. Um, the important thing, of course, is the valuable information. So the reason people migrate data is they want the organization to be efficient, to be productive. They need that valuable information about what's happened in the past, about all sorts of elements of their organization. And then the, the aim of the migration is to put that at the fingertips of the employees. Um, so the important thing is that we can't just not migrate um, we can, we need some of that information. We want to make sure it's available. And so what we're finding is that data migration, legacy data is making migration far more difficult and takes longer than it should. So both because of the size of that legacy data, trying to figure out how they're going to do that, but also because of the complexity of understanding what's in it and then moving it, um, it becomes an issue. And um, successfully moving data and information is a critical component of migration success. So um, if employees log into new systems and can't find the information they need, it's going to lead to a breakdown in process and, and the issues that go with that. So in an attempt to make sure data is moved across, um, we looked at some uh, tech target data um, and some research that they've done. And that showed that 45% of companies um, use a lift and shift strategy. Um, so what they literally do is aim to move everything because they can't make sense of that data and they move it to the cloud, they over provision the destination storage by as much as 55%. Uh, and what they do is they assume that once they get it there, they can then try and do something with it. So Adrian, you were telling me that you have you know customers that have tried to do this as well. Absolutely. And we see it quite regularly when we are working with organizations where they have shall we say complex legacy systems which they uh, which they quite clearly tell us we don't really know what's in it we don't want to we don't have time to understand and we want, don't want to take the risk because we've got no one in the organization that wants to take responsibility so from their point of view the quickest way to deal with the situation is we we need to move my keep the project moving uh, we'll pick up what we've got and literally just provision it in it in the cloud and what we are seeing quite often as well is the challenges with one it's older technology so not really designed to work in the cloud so they spend loads of time and effort making these systems compatible with a cloud environment so, which is a waste of resources so instead of dealing with the problem they're dealing with the technical side of the challenges why why are we actually uh, keeping this data why is it moving to the cloud in the first place and then the second part is once they get it all into the cloud then the challenges come in well how do we secure it where do we put it where do we back it up and that is some of the challenges we're seeing quite often and the the lift and shift has worked for the organizations that needed to move quickly but they've lifted and shifted the problem with them is what we found actually so when they get in the cloud they go well nothing's changed well all you've done is change your tin at the end of the day really in the background uh, um, the compute power a bit more flexibility but you've migrated the same data the same problems so why what did you expect was going to change by moving it into the cloud 
um, you haven't actually done any transformation or reevaluated what you you've been doing and that is where we spend a lot of time with organizations helping them understand the process that it's not just a technical lift and shift but it's also transformation and the time to understand what are you moving and for what reason are you moving it yeah and let's look at this other stat that um tech target talk about which is 70 percent um is the average overspend on migration projects that seems like a lot and it seems like either people are massively underestimating what it's going to take or they get bogged down in it when it happens how does that come about well we there's a number of reasons so Part of it is firstly is one they don't always understand what they are uh, what they're migrating to. So from what the original estimates were, we find that yes, it's quite easy to run into like the Azure calculator or the AWS calculator and understand what your spend is going to be roughly, and get up with a plan uh, to migrate to the cloud. But what we have found is as they start migrating these systems, they are actually discovering data that they previously were in use that they didn't think it was or systems were being accessed or interfaced or worked together in ways that they didn't previously realize purely because of the organic growth that we've seen. And the last part that we're also seeing is the complexity as I just touched on earlier. We are going to lift and shift the systems which should in theory sound straightforward but if you're starting to shift legacy systems like 2003 for example trying to move a, a SQL 2003 box which is quite an extreme to to for example into a uh, into azure you'll find that actually they spend more time converting that data making sure that they can get that data working with sql 2008 and the legacy program still works instead of understanding why do we use it and and i think this is a part that we see a lot of underestimation especially where organizations have written their own applications or use bespoke applications the cost of making those changes to deal and a accommodate these new cloud systems takes a lot of time and effort agreed okay. agreed okay so um so thank you for that adrian that's that's useful insight and so essentially um what's then wrong with it and just to sort of summarize some of the sort of pitfalls here um risky data that is dark gets exposed and gets even more risky um dark data can go from dark to light uh, when it's transferred so data in motion is often more risky than data at rest uh, and of course that's that's a worry Big data volumes cost more to store in the cloud, and as Adrian has already mentioned, cost more to, to back up and to look after and everything else as well. Um, and then dodgy data quality makes it less useful or very confusing for users once in the cloud. So if you bring everything across and you've brought your users on that journey as well, they start logging into the new system to use it, and they find that they're confronted by huge volumes of information, it makes it difficult for them to find the right thing as well. Okay, so um, this is the point at which I'm going to drop in that we have a um, guide, uh, the ultimate guide to data migration, which is a guide that we've written based on everything we've known and found about data migration. It includes a lot of the stats that um, have been talked about already, and it includes kind of some step-by-step -step pieces that we're about to, to go through on the rest of these slides. So if you want to go and find that, you can go to exo.nr slash ultimate hyphen migration um, it's also i believe um on the uh on the right hand side of your screen i'm hoping you can see that report in pdf as well and download it directly from there but if you can't find it there you can also download it from our website so the thing that we're going to talk about and the thing that we're going to advocate um, is the concept of understanding your data estate first to make your migration st um, smarter. Um, and the point is, it's all about not migrating everything, not lifting and shifting, but understanding what you've got before you want to move it and having a much more integrated approach. As Adrian was talking, having the, the thought process around which data you want first before you get tangled up in the technicalities of how to move it across so that you're only doing that job on the valuable bit of information. And this Veritas Databerg report here um, talked about how um, organizational data is um, is comprised and 19% of it um, stored by enterprises in 2020 is considered to be business critical and usable 
Um, 53% of it is considered dark and unclassified, and so it's effectively the, the data swamp, as one of our customers would put it, um, and typically unstructured in nature, so it contains all sorts of documents, text files, emails, etc. And then 28% is considered to be redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And indeed, if you're under um, legislation such as the GDPR, um, could also be over-retained. So not only is it obsolete or trivial or redundant, but actually it shouldn't be there anyway. It needs to be deleted and removed um, so that it doesn't um, increase your risk profile. And so with that in mind, um, we're going to talk about three definitive tactics for successful migration. Um, and they are as follows. Uh, to identify large legacy data sets, understand what data you've got out there, understand the shape of that data within your organization, um, secondly, we're going to look into identifying dark unstructured data and third, improving the quality of the data being migrated. So let's look at that first area. Um, and so the point here is um, to understand what repositories you've got out there, um, what they contain in them, uh, what they have. Um, and this is where we offer the kind of technology you need to be able to understand exactly what you've got and what's in it. Um, and that's a very important thing to be doing across your data estate, of course. But in particular, if you've got a particular um, set of data that you're looking to migrate, um, you need to understand the shape of what you've got so that you can start making those um, uh, those decisions. And Adrian, is it is it really true that people have forgotten shared folders, or um, you know, people talk about you know uh, having file shares that they've kind of forgotten about or don't know they have? Surely they do, don't they? I, I guess I shouldn't admit that, but I actually found one in our own system yesterday. No, surely not. <laughs> from a procedural process from um, to, uh, 2012. And um, and it was a bit of a surprise because it was somebody who left the organization. And at the stage, one of our uh, group staff decided to copy the data in to keep it safe just in case. And it's that that's a good example of folders that exist and data that exist. And I'll be honest with you, I've not seen one company where this has not happened because we're human. That's what we do. And yeah. actually, it's that fear of making a mistake that drives a lot of these forgotten folders because people create information that's needed, but then they move on. They start doing working on a different project. That information is not needed at this case. My, I leave my position. Somebody takes over my position. They come in and go, well, I'm not going to take responsibility and delete that just in case because I don't want to get in trouble in my new role. And the information and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy a little bit because the information just stays there and gets built up and built up. And it's quite interesting sometimes when we help customers discover information, and especially when we're doing some penetration testing or security assessment, the amount of files we find with passwords or old passwords for old systems that has just been written down because we needed to keep it somewhere safe. So I'll put it in a folder. The folder is secure, so we don't need to worry about um, the information that's being stored on the system and it it is quite funny that it's human nature i think that drives a lot of this data retention this data legacy that we've got in place at the moment and i uh but to answer your question yes there's a lot of forgotten folders and most organizations do have that and it's actually databases as well the amount of financial systems i find that's been kept because we might need it for audit purposes well you might have needed it 10 years ago, but I don't think the tax man is going to come visit you anymore after 15 years. But we do find old systems and databases with loads of legacy systems or where organizations have migrated data to a new system and then from that system to a new, new system. Yeah. But they still have the original data from the two systems back that exist there. So it is bizarre um, what you find sometimes. Of course, in IT, the teams, the IT team, will never make a decision to delete anything. They do, they 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 too scared, and somebody's got to take some sort of responsibility in the organisation. Hope that answers the question. A bit long-winded, but I guess the answer is yes. Yeah. So it's a disclosure. I wasn't expecting, um, <laughs> but you are you are indeed human as well, Adrian. That's the. Uh, oh, the that's what I say. We found it because we audit our own systems, and um, yeah. we we run this quite regularly. Enough. We found we double check our own systems because at the end of the day, we are have a responsibility as well. So you got to take a look at yourself, and it's quite easy always to advise somebody else 
on how to secure the data, what they need to do. But you need to do it yourself on your own systems. And it's a bit like, what's the old adage? Um, the builder, happy to help somebody else, but never look after your own property. True. And I think it's it's also about scoping the project as well. So in a, in a migration sense, um, you're not going out there to identify large legacy data sets for the sake of doing it. You're going out there to say, in this new shiny system that we're going to migrate to, which information do we want and where are we going to find the information that's going to be the most value to the organization? Um, and that's when you need to understand your legacy data sets. It's not just for, for the sake of it. It's because you want the good stuff that's in there and you want to be moving it across. Absolutely. Um, and just to say that it's not just moving the good stuff, it's actually understanding the data because that might actually shape how you're going to be moving it and what you're going to be moving towards. Because at the end of the day, if you don't know what you've got, how are you going to build a system that's going to provide you the information moving forward to benefit the organization? Because data is value these days. As somebody said, it's the, the new oil of... Um, organizations data is king and if you don't understand it how are you even going to leverage it exactly and i think then the next thing um is to go back to the to this slide which is some research that we did last year um looking at um, it professionals and dark data um and the concern out there about this this data that's considered dark that that's unstructured unclassified nobody knows where it is they know roughly that it might be on certain systems. They don't even know all the systems exist. They're still finding them. And this is a big concern for information security. So whilst data migrations are not often um, implicitly including information security in the process, it probably should. Because if you're about to do a migration, you're potentially about to increase the risk profile of uncovering that dark data, and you're going to be doing something with it. So involving um, the information security folks in this um, element is is really important as well um, so that the organization can understand the risk of what you're about to do and obviously then take steps uh, yeah. to make it a positive experience rather than a, a risky one. Absolutely. Okay, so we've identified our large legacy data sets. We've chosen from that what we're going to move. We've incorporated our information security element to this to make sure that you know we're not increasing risk profiles by identifying stuff and bringing it out of the dark. The next thing is to actually identify what's in it. Um, and, and this is where you know, our own research talks about 85% um, of organizational data is unstructured and unknown. Um, and you know, this, is, um, this is the next big challenge. So once you've understood what you're going to choose from, you then need to understand what's exactly in those, in those storage areas and how you're going to move it. So that'll be the next thing. Um, and typically here, you see a lot of duplicated and redundant information. And you're going to start having your eye on that because you're going to start wanting to exclude that from, um, from your migration, or you're going to want to deal with it and put it somewhere else, maybe delete it. But as Adrian says, people are very resistant to deleting it, but you're going to need to deal with that along the way. And of course, the problem with dark data and all the risky stuff in there is it only takes one mistake. If we get this wrong with one sensitive file that ends up being remaining unclassified and being moved across by mistake into a new area where um, people are very much more able to access that information wrongly in its unprotected state, that's when um, it only takes one mistake to cause a data breach that we want to avoid and is an imperative for this data migration project. So then the third step of that process is to improve the quality of the data being uh, migrated. So to actually look at the, the data that's there, classify it, protect it, uh, secure the bits you need to secure, et cetera. Um, and 84% of CEOs are concerned about the quality of the data they're basing their decisions on. And of course, classifying it before it's moved is, is crucial to make that happen. Um, do you think that people, in their lift and shift, Adrian, let's say they've lifted and shifted to the destination and then they intend to go back to classify their data later. Do you see that as being more successful in the new environment or is it still just a challenge that people don't get to? It's still a challenge that people don't get to, if I'm very honest. Yes, the new environment normally helps 
a little bit more because you have things like indexing, for example, that's in place in Office 365 for email. So they start having some systems that can be indexed that they couldn't that they didn't have previously, and they they start making a best effort. But it's it's a challenge. Is for a lot of organisations, cleansing data isn't revenue generating. Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, most organizations want to focus on the areas that's going to affect the bottom line, that's going to improve business, that's going to help show value to the organization. And it is finding a way to demonstrate that the data has value. And by going through the exercise, it will benefit the organizations in the long term. And we, I found that where what's more successful is organizations that's done the lift and shift and then get that buy-in explaining and able to demonstrate some of the challenges with costs, for example, of backing it up, as you touched on, that they are running too many systems. Because the big thing that a lot of people forget is compute power costs money. And by just demonstrating and then to the committees or to the executive committee how we can potentially reduce our costs by having these decisions made normally helps drive some of the behavior then that says, right, let's reduce the number of systems. Let's go and clean up this legacy data. Why do we have it? And I can use it even for uh, in our own group where we we do this quite regularly, where we would have meet a specific committee where we have a team assigned to look at the data that we have. Why do we retain it? Is there any contractual obligations? Because if there's not, let's get rid of it because it is a risk to the business. So from our point of view, sometimes it's risk that drives that behavior and cleaning it up. But leaving it to the IT team, again, in some of the organizations, it's not going to happen. It's got to have somebody at the EXO level to be the champion, the CISO, for example, or whoever is responsible for information to drive that change. Because leaving into the IT team, there's always some more interesting project that comes along. And that's what I've seen. And I work with some companies that has not actually cleaned the data. And it's two or three years later since they shifted, lifted and shifted. And they just never have time to actually can revisit it. It's just easier to keep paying that money because it's an operational cost. Nobody actually understands some of these uh, these hosting costs in any case so it's quite easy to forget about it yeah absolutely um absolutely okay so um let's switch back to the slides um we've got um three then definitive tools and tactics for successful migration so we've just run through those really fast um we've identified the large legacy data sets we've admitted to ourselves we don't know where they all are but we found them eventually we've understood which data sets we're going to look for which data sources we're going to include in our migration, which data we need at the end result. Next, we're going to look for the dark, unstructured data in there. We're going to understand what's in those um, areas that we need to, to look at before we migrate it, where the risk is, how to classify it, how to protect it. And then the third thing we're going to do um, is improve the quality of the data being migrated. So we're going to make that last check to understand exactly what's there and choose what it is that we're going to be moving. And in a, in a nutshell, knowing your data is the route to smarter migration. Um, and we believe without understanding how to see your data at scale within your organization, this is gonna always be an incredibly difficult project to try and execute successfully and in a low risk way. Um, so we're gonna move on very quickly to show how Exonar Reveal can be used to help with data migration and what our customers are doing uh, to use it in that way. Before we do, it's the last prompt for um, any questions that you might want to add to the questions. Um, we've had a question around what M&A is. It is mergers and acquisitions. So um, uh, yeah, it's all about buying, selling um, organizations, bringing data sets together. Increasingly, when you have an M&A transaction going on, the value of the data is often part of the transaction itself. So people are buying customers because of the data. Um, and um, and so we've, we're working with customers who are looking to integrate that data, extract the value that they've bought and integrate it with the data they already own uh, after that transaction has taken place. Okay, um, just to whiz through what Exonar Reveal does, we don't want to labor this session on technology or pitch too hard, but we do help to solve this problem. So what we do is we enable organizations to 
go to all of their data sources, um, all of their storage areas, whether that's structured or unstructured data. We enable them to find all of the documents, emails, text, and database rows within that. And then we place it all in, in a massive index of everything that they've got. And that gives a comprehensive up-to-date index that's instantly searchable um, and makes the job of improving data quality, classifying data, understanding dark data, et cetera, far easier to do. And it is used in the, the migration use case that our customers go through. Um, having built the index, we make that index available. Um, and so actually we don't have a specific migration um, example on any of these three screens here, uh, but we do have three examples of the kind of things people use Exonar Reveal for. So information security staff finding and removing toxic data just from an operational perspective, R&D teams extracting info relating to previous research, um, staff carrying out mergers and acquisitions due diligence. So perhaps before you buy the data that you're looking to buy from the organization you're looking to acquire, you want to understand and do your due, due diligence to make sure that that organization's data really is as valuable as you think it's going to be. And of course, in this particular use case for this particular webinar today, um, you can use it for data migration as well. So the migration team would index all of the, the data that they're looking to migrate. They would then understand um, all of the steps we did before and they then know which bits to migrate across into the organization. And the idea is, is that if these were our source and destination um, migration uh, project assets, then you use Exonar Reveal at the stage before you migrate to find, understand, classify, and protect your information. Um, you can then delete redundant, over-retain, trivial, or duplicated data. If you haven't got uh, the ability to delete it, you can certainly put it beyond use or put it into the appropriate area of secured in the appropriate way. And then what that means is what you actually move across is only the clean, classified, and useful data. Um, and hopefully the volume of that data will be much, much lower, which means less time and overhead in actually moving huge amounts of data. You're just moving the data you want. You've also tackled the issue that Adrian was talking about, which is rather than just lifting and shifting the problem, you've hopefully removed the problem, you've surfaced the value, you've protected the information, and now when it's in its destination environment, it's ready to be used by the organization. So that in a nutshell is um, data migration as we see it with our customers and our prospects and working with Softworks. Um, I wanted to open it up to, to Q&A now, um, and I think I need Jamie to, um, to help us. You might need to come off mute, Jamie, and just say hi um, and just facilitate any questions that we've got there because I can't see them. Yeah, sure. That's fine, James. Um, so we've got a, a question that's come in from Anna, uh, which is time pressures come into data migrations and it takes time to clean up data before it's moved. What's your view on the, on the balance between spending the time cleaning it up versus just lifting Sounds and like shifting? Sounds like an Adrian to me. Thank you for that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think it br brings back to the earlier question. You, It will pay off in the long term and it will pay off a lot more, a lot better in the long term by cleaning up the data because I think we touched on it. Once you've done the lift and shift, you want, you're spending extra time lifting problems in the meantime, duplicate data, which I think I will mention is it's ridiculous how, mu how much data is duplicated on systems, actually, when you go and look at it, 30, 40% in most cases. But it is cleaning that data by taking the effort so that you can have the information you need in a secure environment that is designed to accommodate only the data that you will be moving that is needed for the business. So from what I see it is, yes, there's a short-term gain possibly by just doing a lift and shift because guess what? You can rush a project through. You can spend the time and extra time dealing with the technical fallout, but you've done the lift and shift. You can tick the box. We now, we've now we migrated our systems to AWS or Azure. Um, my job is done. However, that problem of dealing with the data hasn't gone away. It's the same problem exists. And now your data is, again, in much easier accessible, still secure, hopefully, if you haven't left any ports open or done anything wrong. But all that data is still there. Now you've got to spend the time to rethink 
how are we going to design the systems what systems are we going to put in place and effectively you're doing another data migration because you end up designing another system or a new service for example or a new structure to accommodate only the data that you want to keep so in my opinion spend the time at the beginning it will pay itself back fivefold tenfold in the long term because you only moving what you need to you getting the system design right and you're also reducing your risk in the migration that's been done yeah and i think i'd add i'd add one thing there which is something we've been toying with doing but haven't worked out how to calculate yet is a comparison of time on a lift and shift versus cleaning because there is some overhead in indexing data so if you were to use our product to to smooth your migration and we've talked about this with our customers there is some overhead in doing that work because while you're doing that work you're not migrating but then the actual migration is going to be much quicker yeah. so the question that comes back is what is actually the roi if you like the time roi on doing it first and only migrating the valuable stuff versus lift and shift and then trying to deal with it afterwards um, and actually you know we'll have to take that as an action to try and do that calculation and try and figure out what it would take i think we've got some examples so actually we should probably uh, aim to write those up as as sort of case studies um, to try and really prove the benefit um, not only in terms of getting the job done first um, but also in terms of could you do a migration quicker and also clean up your data than lift and shift then clean up your data okay so that's great and then um jamie have you got another um another question for us yeah we got one here uh from uh, anil which is um can you talk about how ai uh, machine learning fits in the transformation phase like detecting dropped pii uh, data etc and how to deal with unstructured data wow that's a good question can you leave that question up actually just for a second i'm still i'm still reading it i don't know about adrian yeah um yeah so <sighs> It, it really does fit in. And, and with our technology, we don't have AI and ML um, trained within our platform to do this yet. Um, so what we do is we identify those things using um, pattern matching, using topic extraction, et cetera. And we have a bunch of tools that, that help you identify which is drop data. Um, I hate the phrase dropped, by the way, it doesn't sound very nice to me, but um, but we, we can certainly do that. And then what you do is you you actively deal with that data and move it aside. And then what we also do with our platform is help you find the valuable data that you want to keep. So data in particular, file formats, for example, you can then go and look to protect that and then move it. Um, so we do it without AI or machine learning at this point. But what we do have is an API connection into Exonar Reveal. And we have had conversations with customers recently about plugging all sorts of things into the API. The API gives you immediate access to the index itself. And so it would be possible to um, train machine learning or deploy other AI techniques to your data in the index. And in that mode, what we'd be doing is we'd be indexing all of the data, exposing that index to a third party system that could then do whatever, frankly, you wanted to do with that information. Um, and it's not something that's embedded in our platform. Now, as we move forward ourselves, we are also looking at our own roadmap and we do have plans to, to start using AI and ML in a more meaningful way within the platform as well. So it will be on our roadmap too um the, the immediate way you would do it is via api yeah and i think just to expand a little bit it is ai and machine learning is very important and will be very important as you move forward into your cloud and microsoft's got a lot of these technologies in place but part of the challenge that i found with this ai and machine learning is you need to train it. You need to actually educate it. What do you want to do? How do you want to classify the documents? How do you want to protect it? So for example, upload examples of the contracts you want to protect. But what a lot of organizations don't know is, yes, we've, we would like to do that. And actually, once we move the key information into the cloud, we will leverage technologies like um, information protection, data classification, data loss prevention, all of these tools that's available in the cloud that we didn't really have previously because of the technology. But they challenge, what the challenge still becomes is, 
where do we put that information to start with? How do we structure it? What is a policy? What is our classification policies we want to implement? What information do we hold? So that is almost one or two steps further down the road we normally find because initially there's a long discussion about what in machine learning, what are we going to be classifying the documents, what type of documents, what type of information is important to our organization. And the, with the beauty of this is once you've uploaded the, the right information and you've trained the system, of course, you could go and classify, label it, protect it for you automatically, feed it into your insider risk, viewing who's accessing what information that shouldn't. But the, the challenge that we keep seeing and what um, works really well with XNR is we still don't know what we have currently. We we don't even know what we want to go. Can you at least give us an example of what information we hold? And I think the one time, the, sometimes the feedback I get is ignorance is bliss. Because once you understand the risks that the organization potentially have and the data you have, you have to make a decision. You have to deal with it. And it's the same for a number of organizations. Once we show them the information that they have and help talk them through how they want to classify and how they want to change that. That is what takes the time. But then, yes, absolutely, use your machine learning, use your artificial intelligence, use the tools that's out there to help maintain some of the security and the data loss prevention, for example, moving forward, um, because it is a powerful tool and you can analyze it, your SQL databases, everything else, and classify the information. But somebody's still got to take a look before you just lift and shift the data because the chances are, and I'll give you an example, I had a customer who shifted all the data up, thought they secured it and accidentally exposed every employee's contracts to all staff inadvertently because they got the security wrong and they didn't quite understand, didn't realize some of, there was sensitive data stored in what we call previous general areas, which is what we were saying is it is, was in the dark Nobody knew it was there, so nobody found it. Now that they've moved it all across in bulk move, it suddenly became available. And there was a lot of panic around who viewed it. And a lot of time and effort was then spent understanding who accessed the files, who's seen it, who could have seen it, telling the employees that the data could have been exposed. And that was a consequence of, of actually the lift and shift approach where mm. we'll get it in the system and then we'll go and encrypt and secure it and classify it. Well, by then it was too late. Course, yeah, you, the damage was done. You've accidentally taken it from the dark and put it on the top shelf, basically. Yeah. Hopefully um, that answers. Nightmare scenario. Um, okay, thank you for that, Adrian. So I think we've got time for one more question. Um, Jamie, if you could put that onto the screen. So a question from Jess. Hello, Jess. We're currently going through an SP migration, SP. SharePoint, maybe? SharePoint, maybe, yeah. Um, and have been advised by our consultants to wait until the migration is complete before implementing data classification and retention. Well, that seems somewhat contrary to what we've been talking about, Adrian, wouldn't you think? I think from their point of view, so what we are currently going through a SharePoint migration, just want to reread it. For Do you mind just leaving it up there? I just want to... And I've been advised us to wait until the migration is complete before implementing data classification and retention policies. There might be a reason why they've done that. So I don't want to prejudge what um, what information and for what reason that it's been advised. But normally what the way we would say is as you are uploading the documents into the SharePoint, this is the time to classify it. Understand what you've got, design your classification structure and actually classify um, the information and set your retention policies as the data is moving into SharePoint. Part of it might be, for example, as well, if um, they might have been that they f you first want to go and understand the data and there isn't a current way of doing it, then maybe the idea is that we'd like the SharePoint indexing to run so that they can show you what information is in place. But without understanding the full view, I won't say it's right or wrong, um, but I think I'm surprised is, would be the wording to say because actually it's, when you're moving to a new system, that's a point where you would like to classify and secure your data and set your retention policies to uh, keep X number of data, e.g. financial data, seven years, or um, I don't know, asbestos exposure needs to be kept for 50 years or whatever you're dealing with. Those are the time to set those policies and apply them to the system. But 
without actually understanding your architecture or how it's been designed and what pro the project is, I can't really say it's um, right or wrong. Yeah, okay, that makes absolute sense. Um, so a little answers, bit, it? No, it does. Um, so yes, it, it's a difficult one to answer, but it, it's it's not um, it's not the way we're trying to do it with our customers at the moment. No. Um, okay, so I have a little birdie tells me, and we're not going to put this one on screen. We've got one more question from Anil, but I'd like to take it offline, mainly because um, I can't accurately answer it online. <laughs> um, so I'll be honest. Um, if we could take it online, it's about how accurate our pattern matching is for PII, um, given that wrongly classifying can cause a data breach. And it's actually a little bit more of a, of a topic that I'd like to get into offline. Um, and I, actually, it's interesting that maps back to your machine learning and AI um, question as well. Um, so I think there's a conversation to be had in there. Um, so we will follow up if that's OK, Neil, off, off the end of this. If you'd like to get in touch, we can, um, uh, we can have that conversation. There is an answer, but I know just the man to answer that, and he's not on the call. Um, so with that, I was going to suggest, um, thank you, Anil. Um, I was going to suggest that we wrap up. Um, the next thing that we would recommend, if you are interested in finding out more about the product, we didn't want to talk too much about the product today. Don't like doing that on webinars about business issues. Um, then the perfect way to do that is to come along to our live demo. We run a, a live demo every month where you can log in. It's not one-to-one, -one, it's a group demo, if you like. A uh, little bit like this format, but it's it's only half an hour long, and it's specifically this month we'll cover data migration. So what we do is we quickly outline um, how Exonar Reveal works. We then run through two or three uh, demos of very specific tasks in relation to data migration, and then we do Q&A. So if you want to see a little bit more of the platform in action, please sign up. Of course, otherwise, if you want a one-to-one -one demo, you can sign up as well on our website. Um, but that is the next thing to look for. It is on the 26th of January, which I believe is next Tuesday um, at 11 a.m. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to thank Adrian um, very much for coming along. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, Softworks is a great partner of ours. Um, we love having you on uh, with our content and talking about your customer experiences. So thank you very much. No, it's a pleasure and thank you for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure, my pleasure too. Um, and thanks everybody for coming along. Thank you for being interactive. Um, Steve D did pitch in with something that looks a bit like hieroglyphics earlier on in the chat. Um, I hope you're okay, Steve. Um, and sorry, we didn't catch any specific questions from you. Um, I hope everyone um, enjoyed the session today. Uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, look out for our future sessions and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you.